I imagine them coming from the forest uh, in the middle of the night after a big party in the village and everyone has drunk and have started to fall asleep and you can see like glittering on the lake or a mist rising from the forest. You rub your eyes and you see that there's something flying among the trees and I think it's the ferries coming towards the village. <laughs> a tailor named Vidkun has found one of the fairies' magic, magical path and followed it to a groove filled with riches. He has brought jewelry and money back to the village in Or, uh, and bought everything he could ever want. What he doesn't know is that his money will twist the minds of those who spend it. For that madness to end, the fairy queen must be tricked into accepting her own stolen treasures as a gift. Hello and welcome back to Making a Monster. It's been a few weeks, I know. I took some time off after my vacation in the Rocky Mountains. That's where I recorded the running water ambience you're hearing in the background. But I'm back now and I've got a list of monsters as long as my arm to share with you. And usually this podcast is about one monster in particular, a given specimen or a certain species, if you will. But not every game treats monsters that way. The ones that treat them differently offer unique gaming experiences with unique perspectives on folklore and culture. Today's interview is one such departure. We'll be talking about fairies. All of them. It was recommended to me by a previous guest, Michael Sands, creator of Monster of the Week. Is there anybody else you think I should talk to? Anybody who might kind of enjoy doing this? I just got in the mail the other day this, which is Vason from Freeligan. It's a slightly anachronistic 19th century Nordic countries game of folkloric monsters and investigating those. It does some quite interesting things with how they generate monsters. So I thought you might want to get in touch with them. I might. And I did. Did I pronounce your name right? You can say it either way, but N Nils Hinze in Swedish. A little bit German. It's an old German or, or probably Netherlandish name. And is that where you're calling from? Is Norway? No, no, it's Sweden. The most southern part of, of Sweden. People say with, that we, we speak as we have porridge in our mouth. In this part of it. <laughs> and we kind of do. <laughs> so it's not certain my pronunciation is the best. Name. <laughs> my name is Nils Hinze and I'm a freelance uh, writer. I mostly work for the Free League and I am the lead writer for Basin. I've always been like wanted to write and just used my imagination a lot. I wrote plays for theaters and I wrote short stories and in, in two, 2006, I started to write for a role-playing game called The Oktoberland, a Swedish steampunk game. And then later, the same author, he, he published a second version of that game for the Free League. And he asked me to write like the scenarios and campaigns. And when I started to do that, I was like, why haven't I <laughs> written role-playing games? I love role-playing <laughs> games. I <laughs> love to write. <laughs> so I was like, hmm. Can you tell me how you were involved or, or how this game came to be before it was published? First, it was a, a book, a book with illustrations and texts about Vaisen in the north. Johan Egerkans did this book with text and illustrations about uh, Nordic bass and Nordic creatures, where he he he, um, he collected like uh, old stories fr from uh, the 19th century Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and and just made a book about it, and and it it became really popular and has sold really well, and it's it's really good as well, of course. And he is a guy who has illustrated a lot of role-playing games before but after this book he, he was able to illustrate a lot of other great things as well so at first it was that and, and then the free league decided they wanted to make a role-playing game out of it i was contacted with like we're going to make a game it's about monsters of the week and it's going to be like a game called Fock, uh, an old swedish game that was like a copy of Shill, the, the American game, which I loved when I grew up. It was, it was my game, so I was hooked from the start. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I went to a meeting with them, and, and they at first they didn't tell me that it was Johan Egerkans' uh, book we're going to work with. So it took me a while to understand that. And, and when I did, I was really hooked on it because I love that book. And at first, I, the, the thought was that I should just write a 
campaign for the game. But then they asked me, could you write this chapter? And I wrote that chapter. Could, could you write some more? And I wrote one chapter and one more and one more. <laughs> and then I written the entire rule book. And I wrote the, the campaign as well at the same time. For this product, they, they had a fairly good overview of what they wanted. It should be Monster of the Week. It should be 19th century and, and, and so forth. Uh, so I kind of tried to realize their plan and, and write something that would be in the same mood, in the same that Johan Egerkan's illustrations. I wanted to make them come alive because I think his, his illustrations are very much alive. And I, I think the monsters that he draws are... I think they're not just monsters. You can see that they are intelligent, that they want things, they think things, they are multidimensional. They're not just orcs about to find gold or whatever. So I wanted to, to have that in the game. Can you tell me what the word vasen means? It really means creature, monster. It's a Swedish word, vasen, but, but it's kind of like... Uh, it's hard to translate, really, because it's, it's also... If you say vasen in Swedish, you think of something magical, something that exists in a pond in the forest with uh, mist around it, something that kind of like will haunt your soul. You, you don't think about orcs. You don't think about classical demons, really. Vasen is like, uh, and it's kind of similar to the word soul as well. You could say your vasen as in your soul. So it is creature, but it's not exactly the same. That's fascinating. Was it important to culture in a particular way, what Johann's work did? Was he capturing a certain part of culture and folklore that the Basin occupy? Uh, I would say that he captured not the particular section of it or, or something like that. I think he captured the whole thing very good. With Basin existed in the 19th century in, in people's minds because they wanted to explain the inexplainable. They wanted stories about how children could die from famine and, and from suffering and dreaming about going somewhere and, and having an easier time and finding rich <laughs> luxuries and stuff. Uh, and I think Vasen was created out of that. And, and every Vasen is kind of connected to where the stories were told so the stories about Vasen are they are different all over Sweden uh, and you could almost say that really there's only one Vasen <laughs> but you talk about it differently in different uh, parts of the country uh, and I think it captures all of that very good one of the things I understood when I started to to work with the material more is how connected it is to my own background, my own history. I mean, my ancestors told stories about Vasen, uh, and that was the most fascinating for me to just go back and look w what were the stories that existed in Bjuv, where I grew up? Uh, what was the stories that existed in, I don't know, northern parts of Sweden and, and so forth? And, and I think it really... He got that connection between the rural country and, and those creatures. So obviously I'm kind of a 21st century American. What are the things that I would need to know in order to understand 19th century Sweden? <laughs> um, I know it's a big question. <laughs> I, I, and I think it, it, I could answer it in so many ways. One way I want to answer it is to say that you should, if you want to play bass and you should probably play it where your ancestors are from. You should play it where you are living now and just start digging in their surroundings. What are the old places that existed here? So that is one answer. But if you really want to play in the Nordic countries, we had a choice in, the, in this aspect. We could either try to like explain the entire Nordic parts of Europe uh, in like 500-page book, or we could go the way we did that, we said that it's a, uh, it's a version, it's a mythological version of the Nordic countries. So you kind of make up your own version of, of Sweden in the 19th century. But of course, there are some, some things that are true. <laughs> how, how, how do you say it? You could say that it, it's, it's a country that is about to be um, urbanized. It's about to be industrialized. It has been Christian for a very long time. but And the game is really about this, how people 
stop living in these rural communities where they have been living there for like thousands of years in the same small villages telling the same stories but during the 19th century they all moved well, not all but many of them moved to the cities and started to working in the industrials in in, in, in the industries yes uh, yeah and i mean uh, there were a lot of big science uh, evolutions or whatever you want to call it so life really changed for a lot of people and one thing that happened is that the stories about vas and wasn't really relevant anymore it wasn't necessary anymore when we go into the 20th century those stories changed and many of them were forgotten so i'm the whole game is about how society changes during the 19th century railways uh, mines uh, industries uh, chemical wastes yeah and so forth um, so, so I mean, if you got that urbanization part, you can just place it anywhere in the in the world. Yeah, uh, and that's happened everywhere. Yeah, I mean, so so you don't have to know that much about Sweden in particular. I don't think so. Sure. How would you describe the game as a whole and the kinds of mechanics that are in it? It's absolutely a monster of the week game. You, you have your base, your headquarter in a town called Uppsala in the middle of Sweden. And you venture out in the rural parts of the country. You are all city people. And you go out into these villages where things have started to go wrong since the Vesen are, are obviously noticing that people are changing. And some of them are like going mad. Some of them are killing people. Some of them are disappearing. Sometimes it's the Vasen that are the victims, but things are changing. So you're going out into these countryside places where you're isolated, there is no help, and there is always a mystery to solve. There is a way to make things kind of okay. And I would say it's not a game where you like compete against the game and try to make as good character as possible. It's a, it's a game where you tell stories and you help each other and you the game master could ask the players, give me some good ideas. I, I can't come up with anything and, and, and so forth. That would be absolutely okay to do. Yeah. So does it operate on a central mechanic in the way that Dungeons and Dragons would rely on a 20-sided die? Yeah, it does. I think almost all of Free League's game have have the the year zero engine, which is you roll like a dice pool of, of D6s and sixes are hits. If you fail, you can push the roll. Uh, that means re-rolling, but that also means taking some kind of damage. You, you get angry or you get wounded or you, you pay a price to, to, to try again. So that, that is the basics of the game. That's the core of the mechanics. Of all the Vassin in this game, is there one that, you, uh, that sticks out to you as uh, kind of the best one to talk about or one that exemplifies your work or the tone of the piece or just your favorite? I would say all of that uh, <laughs> um, in fairies. I know that fairies are, is, is a part of the Swedish folklore, but to me, it's also very, I know, Celtic or, or British. Yeah, but there's I, a I, lot of different places where, and that's why I wasn't sure of the pronunciation. It, the, the word crops up in a lot of different places. Yeah. But I think they, they really, they are absolutely my favorite. And I think they really set the tone for, for, for this game. And to me, they are like, they, they should be written by Neil Gaiman and be a part of the Sandman comics. <laughs> they would fit so well in, in his stories. I mean, there are like beautiful creatures who have almost no empathy they do whatever they want, and they don't really care about the consequences of their, their actions. And they could be really grim, but also really um, give things and promise things, absolutely. So they are like these uh, kind of like pretty psychopaths who are really powerful <laughs> and hard to, to hurt. You can't really hurt them. And I think that they can be used well in a, in a vasing game. And I imagine them 
coming f from the forest uh, in the middle of the night after a big party in the village and everyone has are drunk and have started to fall asleep and you can see like a glittering on the lake or a, or a mist rising from the forest and, and you know you, you rub your eyes and you see that there's something flying among the trees and i think it's the it's the fairies coming towards the village to just wreak havoc with their with their magic driving people mad and changing time and just doing tricks that to them are just funny but they could be horrible i mean they're they're absolutely interested in babies and children fascinated by them but they have no moral they don't care what they do so i think they could be really both horrible and and comical and and interesting as well and i think they could be interpret that symbolic as well I, i've thought about it a little and i think they could be a symbol for for dreamers i mean they they um, they often offer gifts they often promise things but that gold is most often just sand uh, and they could be interpreted in a really harsh way the dreamer who will inevitably go wrong <laughs> who will be punished for for uh, thinking too big yeah i think the english word for that might be hubris yeah yeah absolutely the, the, the kind of the bad part of creativity or you can even interpret them as madness as, as people i mean people uh, are uh, affected by the the fairies but they have really just lost their minds they have been driven insane um, so it could be like a way to talk about uh, mental illness as well. I think they're interesting and, and, and have a depth to them. Absolutely. I mean, you, you've hit on all of the reasons why I'm making this show, because I think all of these all of these different meanings can be bound up in an individual creature, and they often are. And I like creatures that aren't evil. I, I think evil is uninteresting. Fairies will absolutely do evil things. They will do things that are bad, but they are not evil. They have no evil intentions. They just don't care. They want to have fun, kind of. Uh, that is more interesting, I think. Yeah. So let's talk about how this is implemented in the game a little bit. I know Michael Sands' game Monster of the Week, which shares its name with the genre, doesn't have a monster manual, doesn't have a list of monsters that you can pull and then put in the game and, and use in that way. How does Vassen do it? Vassen does have a, a monster list or a, or a Vassen list, but it should be interpret that it, like these are examples of vas and this is how you can do it and with every vas and there is in-game text and there are a big section with examples of how to use this vas in a conflict how to build a mystery around them so you you can use the information really flexible it's not like firm facts hammered into stone that way so they're almost more like a template that you could apply to any number of things. Yeah, yeah. And I think that corresponds well with how Vassen are. I mean, how all folklore is. I mean, there are so many versions of what a certain creature is and can do and can't do and how you stop it and so forth. So there isn't, uh, you wouldn't have a page on a certain monster that would say, this is how strong it is, or this is how many hit points it has, or this is how charismatic it is or this these are its specific actions it can take there are some characteristics they, they have like three values four values no sorry <laughs> five values they have like how many dice they roll to use magic how many dice they roll to manipulate and so forth but uh, in the rules it is stated that they can they can do like types of magic but the specific enchantments and so forth must be decided and, and adapted to a specific mystery so i mean in one mystery a creature can do this and in another mystery they can do that they should be adjusted to, to and heighten the mood and the theme of the, of the scenario there is always a ritual there are no monsters or maybe there is one monster but yeah, I think there is one monster who can be killed with force. Uh, all monster must be driven away by a ritual. You must do something specific to to make them go away, and that corresponds with how 
how they were uh, spoken about in folklore. If if you hit a, a fairy, they they don't take any damage. They, you can't kill them. You can't fight them. You have to do something to make them go away. And there is suggestions for what this could be in in a particular scenario. So it says there that some fairies will leave if they feel tricked or outsmart or when their spells are broken. So that could be one way that, that the player characters will have to defeat them. Or you can drive them away by blowing into their dwellings with a bellows. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so there are certain ways. You, you can ring with, with the bells from, from a shirt, so sprinkle holy water and so forth. So a big part of the mystery is finding out what is the ritual to, to make this basin calm down or die or go away. And if you fight the basin, it won't go well. You, m- you might survive, but there are both really powerful and and you can't really hurt them so that that is not a good idea in this game so the process of actually playing or running this game would be a bit more like 20 questions it's sort of a game of leading your players to the right pieces of it without outright telling them this is what you need to do yeah yeah absolutely that that is absolutely one part of it finding the information finding out what to do but in good mysteries, I would say that there are choices to be made. I mean, in some some sometime you will find out. No, we shouldn't do any ritual to drive this vase and away, away, or maybe different groups of players will do different things. So, in the best mysteries, there is like a a moral question as well, and there is always every mystery has is built around two conflicts. There is always a vase and conflict and a, a human conflict at the location you where you go. Too. So there could be like conflicts between two groups in the community, and, and and most often you won't solve that conflict. It's just something happening while you try to solve this mystery. How do you think the the Vassan conflict and the human conflict interact? Is it important that they match? I don't think so. I I, I think it it could be really nicely done with with like a theme that is the same for for both the conflicts. I mean, if you have like a hopeless love theme in the human conflict, you should have something corresponding to that in the Vesin conflict, but you really don't have to. As you would like this game to be played, especially talking about fairies, what do you think that kind of gives us when we go into our, our regular lives? Does this sort of help us understand any issues that we're dealing with even now that urbanization has happened and the industrial revolution is over i think this this game has a really clear theme to me i think it's obvious that that the vasen gave us something and i mean uh, the strong christian belief in 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 sweden had a good impact i mean i mean it was it was helpful to also to have a firm place in the world to live somewhere where your ancestors has lived for for uh, centuries to know how to explain things i, I think that was um, really what do you say in english trig uh, secure it gave security mental security and i think it helped people understand the world it, it helped people get through crisis and I think now we live in a time where most things are not certain. Everything is questioned. Your identity is up for grabs. I mean, you could be whoever you want. You can transform in however ways you want. You can. You, you are never finished with who you are. I mean, it must be so much harder to be a teenager today than it was in these times. And I think, of course, there is both good and bad things. I mean... <laughs> It must be horrible to be certain teenagers and with certain things. And in the 19th century, it must be absolute nightmare in some aspects. But in some ways, I think it also was good to have a society that is understandable, a world that is comprehensible. I, I think the game is about it's about the world leaving the world where, where you can explain things, where you can like symbolically talk about things and going into this really harsh and hard industrialized world. I mean, the, 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 the cities in the 19th century, they were like the nightmare version of our poor places in cities today, even if those are bad as well. 
fairies and 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 Vesen stands for a way to openly speak about dreams and and, and longings and and uh, hurts uh, that is really simple you can just talk about these these stories that are also shared they're shared in a community you are not alone in this everyone knows these stories and then we went into a world where everyone is alone yeah you can do everything but you have nothing to stand on and you're you have no one around you. everyone moves around so my aim was to find this point in history when it goes from one thing to the other and both things have their good things and their bad things yeah i'm rambling a little no, no <laughs> sorry i i'm, I'm <laughs> if you if we had a video <laughs> feed uh yeah you could tell i'm just i'm wrapped um this is <laughs> michael gave me good advice like this is exactly the kind of thing i was hoping to discover when i started this project it's it's beautiful oh I, I agree with you. I think all games should have a theme, and I think they have a theme. I think you want something with choosing those rules instead of those rules, and, and so forth. And, and that is much of what interests me as a role player as well. Nils Hinze continues to write and design RPGs, including Farsight, a space opera conversion for D&D 5th edition. Vassen is available directly from Free League Publishing, or Freya Ligen in Swedish, or wherever you get your games. The Free League continues to create new and exciting RPG products like the Kickstarter smash The One Ring, which brings 5th edition mechanics directly to Tolkien's Middle-earth. You can find links to all that content and more on the show's website, scintilla.studio slash monster. That's S-C-I-N-T-I-L-L-A dot studio slash monster. Nils was an amazing person to interview, and there's a lot that I couldn't include in this episode. We talked about Tales from the Loop, the game he designed from Simon Stallenhag's art book of the same name. Stallenhag's evocative concept art was a viral sensation for its wistful look at an alternate 1980s Sweden, full of pastoral vistas and rusty robots. You might also recognize Tales from the Loop from Amazon Prime's 2020 serial adaptation, so I couldn't leave that tape on the cutting room floor. I've made it available as one of many perks for the show's patrons at patreon.com slash scintilla studio. Follow the link in the show notes to see this and all the other amazing things you can get by becoming a monthly supporter of the show. Music in this episode is by Arcane Anthems, who creates free music for tabletop role-playing campaigns, streams, and podcasts. This track is called The Wild Mother Guides, and is one of many tracks inspired by D&D juggernaut Critical Role. You'll find a link to his work in the show notes. Be sure to tell him I sent you. Thanks for listening to Making a Monster. If you like what you've heard and you want to support the show, please share it with the people you play games with. Your recommendation or a link in your Discord lets other people know they can trust me with their time and attention. And it's a real gift to me and the creators I feature. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. See you then.